All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We are into game number two. GMU leading with one game over UT Austin, who found themselves with a 3,000 gold lead and then just couldn't take it anywhere. They they were so far ahead. They were doing really well. They had won those laning phase. The pressure from the Morgana Caitlin was fantastic. And then things kind of just started to fall apart as George Mason's power. The thing that they do best is those grouping team fights. And with a little bit of help of that York split push and then him being able to 1v2 multiple times, he uh, and the rest of the team ended up securing themselves victory in game number one. Yeah, and I mean, it was a very decisive victory, honestly. It was a back and forth game where both teams kind of had their foot in there, but it really just felt like that they were in it from the whole time. You know, up, down, they always felt like they had a chance. Absolutely. Now, we want to see Austin come back. We want to see Austin do well. We want to see them show what they can actually do. You know, we had a little bit of a little bit of a hiccup. You know, sometimes it happens. It's a best of five series. You get the opportunity to say, okay, okay, running double assassins didn't really help us out. And we kind of got split up. That last play between the uh, Infernal Drake and the Baron was just unfortunate. Split decisions. Leave the Trundle, your frontline tank, your main man leave him to finish off the infernal and then your other four members started to head towards the baron but they left the morgana because morgana turns around and goes back to the trundle to try to help out in the 1v1 against yorick making the fight around the baron a 4v3 and with the champions that gmu had there's no way that they weren't going to win that so austin gets split up they lose both fights and they lose their nexus as a result let's see if they can do something a little bit different this time as silas was allowed to sneak Sneak through, so Railgun will grab that for the top lane. And now Austin, or sorry, GMU, they get the opportunity to once again decide what they want. They're gonna go for the Galio support. Again, they're bread and butter. This time, though, they're taking the Jarvan into that jungle. Another classic pick for them. I want to see whether or not Anime Lover goes again, the Oriana, or if he finally decides, you know what, let's go with something else. And if he does go Oriana, what does Austin have in response? Because they have to know that that's something that's coming carried last game. Yeah, I think that the Galio pick is something that they should always feel safe kind of blind picking. And Jarvan with it, right? Because Jarvan's such a potent pick with the Galio. Mmm, lobby bug again. Rip Arenos, welcome to uh, the League of Legends client. You can't have it every single time. Something is going to go wrong. Looking like they're going to have a bit of a refresh with that bug. But because everyone kind of knows what's going on already, it shouldn't take us long to get back to where we were before. And all the picks should be pretty much the same this time through as well. So as we get back into it, go ahead with what you were saying. I forget exactly where I was going. <laughs> That's what happens thoughts. when bugs happen. Um, it pauses. It's Galio especially. Jarvan. Go it's ahead. just, it's really, it's a combo. You know, Jarvan's yeah. able to jump on top of people, oh, and Galio's always going to be able to get onto them. This means if people don't have dashes, they're stuck inside the Cataclysm. Oh, Barring having a flash, um, really crazy to put that summoner spell on such a high importance. Also, just to note, Silas could be going mid. That's true. That is true. Poopsters could do that. He did well with the talent, but as the game progressed, couldn't catch on to those squishier members and the uh, Galio specifically. His taunts were so good. It protects your ADC and those grouping, the, the Galio and the um, Sivir never really left each other's side. And so when you have Sivir's spell shield and you have the Galio taunt, that's a very, very safe duo. Talon never quite could get in and get those kills. And the sideline did very well, but outside of that, didn't. So we'll see whether or not Silas is going to be that top lane or potential mid lane. And there's always the potential of him running AP or tank. So as Celsius locks in Zaya for Requiem in the bottom lane. Yeah, now Zaya Rakan, a very potent lane. I think it always will be. This was kind of the goal of releasing these two. Um, the issue, in my opinion, of the lane is that it's so reliant on Rakan to engage and Zaya to be a self-sustaining damage dealer. Um, which, I guess, like, that's what people kind of want out of their bot lanes, but I feel like there's just other picks that that's not the dynamic, right? I have a friend who always says that Leona does the work for him. Which is why he loves Leona supports. I am... Hey, someone... <laughs> Go ahead. 
I'm just that's it. That's it. Oh, okay, because I I'm a Leona main, and uh, I actually am this season one tricking Leona. I absolutely love Leona. She's my favorite champion. Uh, early game can feel a little bit difficult, but once you hit six, it kind of feels like the world is your oyster. And then when you get double tank items underneath your belt, you can just stand in the enemy's face and just be like, "What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? I have CC for days. I can tank you all. You aren't going to walk past me. Feel free to." Just slash surrender because there is nothing that you can do to stop me. Now, I am heavily reliant on my ADC, and that's something that Rakan also is. He has fantastic engage. The best thing about his engage is that he can usually also get out, but besides doing a little bit of taunt and a little bit of CC, he brings zero damage. And so that's where that Zaya and that Silas are really going to come into play, as this time it looks like GMU and Enrique is going to be running the Lucian rather than the Sivir. So, similar champion, not as good wave clear on the early or even late game side, but a fantastic duelist in the early game and we have seen some massive damage level one level two lucians uh, to really set up the bottom lane in favor of gmu where they struggled so much last game see when it comes to lucian um i'm a fan but i have to stay a bigger fan of sever a bigger fan of sever wow that's a tongue twister <laughs> um so, like, we all know there's a pretty famous streamer who's been a Sever enthusiast himself trying to climb up through Master Tier this season. And it's just a very strong pick. I don't think it loses many lanes, and especially with the Galio, um, I feel like it's a fine answer into Zaya Rakan. But we'll have to see what comes out here from Requiem and TY for when. So it could be that instead of trying to run with the Sivir Spell Shield and deal with Rakan's knock-up with his uh, Grand Entrance or anything of that sort, instead Lucian's just going to sidestep it. He's got his Rutless Pursuit to just kind of dash away from it. We'll see if that comes out because he could still be hit by the Quickness Taunt and that could set up uh, the side of Austin for success as GMU is going to go ahead and lock in the Jax. And Austin looks like they're going to go for a Kindred Jace. So yet again, follow, running a very interesting composition. The Jace and Kindred, they've got no frontline tank whatsoever. Hold on. Am I seeing this right? That yeah, is really uh, interesting. Go ahead. some decisions here. <laughs> um, so it's, the way that I envision this composition working is that everyone has a little bit of self-peel, right? Um, the Silas is going to be able to kind of like steal ultimates away and he has the big heal so he can always get something off of that Although this game it's really just looking like the Jax is going to be the big thing he gets um, in the terms of protections uh, But he still has great ultimates to steal nonetheless, right? How does Oriana work with Silas? I'd like to know that interaction as for another time. It is going mid too, by the way Oh, um, further that... <laughs> some decent wombo. The biggest question mark this draft is Jace yeah, Jace is a very interesting character. He's able to transition between the the range and the melee. He does a lot of damage. He's actually even showing up in LCS as a champion of choice several times, um, especially against different people that he can poke out of lane quite well. His team fighting is strong. His split push is good, but he just isn't a frontliner. I I mean, he's a great engage, but he isn't that frontline. So once again, it's going to be on Austin to find these picks, find the laning edge. They are relying so heavily on the snowball. Now their late game is better than last game. They've got the Zaya that deals pretty good damage. Once Kindred gets over four marks, she's going to become a monster of her own. She's got her own ultimate that can basically reset fights as necessary. Uh, Rakan taunt as well. But I don't know. I just look at the Oriana. I look at the Galia. I look at the Jarvan, and I say that is terrifying. I mean, Austin, or GMU, sorry, excuse me, is basically running the exact same composition they ran last time. Jarvan switched out for Sejuani, who can uh, be, a, again, a engage semi-tank with plenty of damage. You've got Jax Jungle, but that's basically traded out for the York Split Push. You've got Lucian, but that's just Sivir, you know, differently. He's going to be a more in-your-face team fighter than Sivir, but he can still deal as much damage. And GMU says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Roll a similar composition, and let's see what we can do. I don't know. No, I'm personally a big fan of sticking with the same composition. Um, I actually coach a high school team, um, and I coach a bronze, silver, gold team. Much more enthusiastic about the high school team, as you could imagine. Um, but what we kind of do is try to stick to the same compositions as much as possible. And I think it just lets people play their position and their role a lot more clearly. 
something you don't get when you're trying to switch up the style every game and that does happen when you're trying to play this like assassin style game right when it's talon and akali one game and then it's silas and jace the next you really end up having to play around the champions that you're picking now, the one thing you could say for Austin is the fact that they're on not as assassin, but they are better poke. They've got a decent, not great, but a decent poke composition between the Silas and the Jace, uh, Zaya's Feathers. They're going to be able to siege turrets a little bit better, but I still end up fearing that you can siege the turret for a while until... Jarvan decides it's time, I'm bored, let's flag and drag, Cataclysm and Galio Ultimate on top, Orianna Shockwave on top of that, and again, you're looking at Austin and going, okay, these are champions that they themselves do want to be in the fray. I mean, Jace wants to be able to poke for a while, but then transition into his hammer. Get that lightning just hitting everyone. Silas wants to be able to steal away an enemy ultimate and then dive on in, smashing his chains in everyone's faces. Zaya has to be close enough that she can pull those feathers and rend through everyone. I know that's Calista's ability, but uh, it's the same idea as you're tearing those feathers through the enemy team. She has to be somewhat up close and personal. These aren't the long range disengaged champions like a Heimerdinger. So I'm pretty scared. I think GMU have a pretty good powerhouse, but Austin, I would love for you just to blow us away with an amazing game. I would absolutely love to see them come through and do something that we've never seen before and compete in a way that we haven't seen them compete before. I just, well, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough for them, especially with the Jace. And I, mm, let's just hope Kendra gets six marks. <laughs> there you go. So let's talk about things that they could do. All right, so we, we've definitely harped on them, said the struggles for the composition. Let's look at the positives. On the positive side, they've got a strong bottom lane if they can hit level six first. Rakan Zaya, incredibly powerful when paired together and hitting that level six. Rakan's quickness says, there's no escape for you. Then Zaya says, I've got a root for you as well. And if you try to do anything to me, my ultimate says, nope. Plus, I'll deal extra damage to you as well. Silas, he's got lots of options for stealing away ult Ultimates, both that Galio to maybe group with his team whenever something of that nature happens in the 5v5, maybe that's what he's hoping for, as well, excuse me, as well as just in general, he is a very strong champion, still waiting for some hard nerfs to come through, um, so there, there's some potential, things are nervous, I'm sure we'll continue to discuss, which I'll let this uh, flyover cam fly Oof. for a little bit longer as we are into a short pause, so, either way, I'll still welcome you all to the game number two. George Mason University taking on University of Texas Austin. This is going to be an exciting game. It is a best of five, so we're definitely going to get at least one more game out of this. But we need to see who wins this one. Yeah, and we're very excited if we can get a couple extra, too. And as we know, even if we do get the 2-0, like you said last time with George Mason... Um, they did have to play all five. Oh, yes. <laughs> and and honestly, even, we'll talk a little bit because we're in this pause. Despite George Mason winning the first two games in a fairly decent fashion to the last game, right? They they were fairly even for most of the game. Ups and downs here and there. Good things, bad things. Big team fight at the end of the game. They get the Baron, they win. That was kind of how they won the first two games last uh, playoffs on s last Saturday. And then game three, they ran a wild composition. I don't even remember all their choices, but it was very different, very few tanks. Uh, and then <laughs> game four, they just completely got so hard stomped that at the 18 minute mark, they surrendered the game because it was, I believe something like 11 to zero with a 5,000 or 6,000 gold lead. It was mind blowing how hard they got. So I was like, they just turned their brains off and stopped playing league for an entire game. Then we get into game five. And in game five, George Mason goes down on their Nexus turret to 282 health. That is one auto attack away from being destroyed. And they are able to successfully defend their Nexus. And because they won the fight around the Nexus, they went and grabbed themselves a Baron. They TP'd a member into the enemy team base, and they finally pushed in for a victory but they were one auto attack away from losing that series. So definitely don't just say, oh, this is a solid team. They're going to play well. They're going to win a team fight at the end and win the game because uh, George Mason is always an interesting one to watch. Yeah, I can definitely tell they're a little interesting to watch, especially with a name like Anime Lover uh, and then R.I.P. to Takashi. 
It's a premature RIP, but you can't snitch like that and get away with it. <laughs> Come on. Little respect. It's all good. Jace is pretty pushed heavily into that top side for Austin, trying to get a little bit of vision down early. I don't know if he's seen the J4. Should see the J4 now. The J4 is actually going to walk in to try to drop a ward. He'll get poked out. He's just going to say, go with a flag. This is something that Ion did last se series as well. Went with the Jarvan in the top lane and ran the AP early Jarvan. Now he switches over to AD later, but he starts with that Doran's ring and he starts with that flag because its AP is pretty good as early game poke. However, he might lose out on the poke against this Jace. There's a little bit of fighting in the mid lane, not going to do all that much. I think you're right to say that he's going to lose out on the poke war with the Jace. Of all the picks for you to be able to beat in the world, Jace is not one of them. Kindred, on the other hand, though, gets the luckiest type of spawn right now. This sets her up for a good game. It's also why I'm afraid of this pick. Lots of RNG regarding those marks, but I believe, what is she, is that her first mark? I think that should be her first mark. Yeah, so that's her first mark. It's always yeah. gonna spawn on one of the scuttle crabs, and what kind of happens is, you end up on a position where you have to choose between top or bottom. And in this case, right, she chose top, she chose correct, she wins. Um, it's a really odd mechanic. I honestly hate it. Slither PTSD trigger. I'm sorry, Slither Hands. I'm sorry. I just had to talk about it, all right? Had to talk about it. I know the chat's going to be a little bit late, so that's going to come through a little bit on the later side. But either way, it looks like Kindred and Jax may find each other out a little bit in this jungle. There we go. Counter-Strike from Firefly. Nice stun onto the Kindred. Celsius having to run. Maybe force to flash over the wall here. Will Jax flash as well? He will. Leap strike in. Auto-attack and powered auto-attack as well. Jace gets a little bit of poke. Firefly decides it's time to run, but Jace is already here. He's going to flash in to make sure he goes down. And first blood goes over to Celsius. And a nice knock-up onto the Galio on the bottom lane. Hold on. Rylas may go down. Uh, no heal used by Enrique yet. Galio drunken potions left and right. Trying to get himself back up as Requiem's getting some good push down. We saw this last game. Enrique goes forward. That's a turret shot on to take it for the win. Rallis wants the shot. He's got it on both. He's low health. He flashes away. Enrique getting a little bit of damage. Has to back away though because no, neither team burning those spells decides to go in for the kill. So a lot of fighting. Only one kill. First blood to UT Austin. Very exciting little spree there. I think that the biggest takeaway though is that Kindred has two marks at three minutes and 50 seconds. She's scaling towards that six mark dream I was talking about. This might be the game. Puts that mark onto Anime Lover in the mid lane too. So we're going to be expecting a gank and we're going to be expecting it soon. Oh, lots of turret shots onto these bottom laners for Austin, but they are playing so aggressively. 27 minions on the side, 14 of Lucian. Jax is towards the mid lane, shows up, says hi, walks away. Railgun's got low mana, auto-attacking Io down, gets it! Beautiful Q at the last second before the flag and drag allows J4 to escape, and it's a two-kill start. Austin, once again, setting themselves up well in the early game. This happened last time. We need to see, though, if they can carry this snowball through. So, I don't have a Nunu, it's gonna be a little hard, right? <laughs> I like it, yep. And one of those things is once the turrets go down, that's when things get truly tough because that's where things kinda got turned around last game. When the turrets go down, it's team fighting time, it's time to fight around those objectives. And when you don't have the team fighting composition, you're going to lose out on those. So they need to have such a lead when those turrets go down that either they can just straight up win those team fights just because of sheer power and gold income, or they can just transition that strength from those turrets into uh, repositioning and skirmishes around the map and jungle that favor their team. I own, despite getting pushed underneath the turret, drinking up those corrupting potions, is still poking down Railgun pretty well. Both are down to about half. Railgun getting man, a little bit of poke. Talk. He's pushing the mini wave in. What'd you say? I said, man, you talked. He was <laughs> doing really well, and then he lost the life feed. Oh, yep. Caster Curse. There you go. A little bit of root into the bottom lane. Hold on. Galia steps forward, finds the taunt onto Ooh. one. The Rakan, but he's going to immediately dash away. Yeah, that's the problem with Rakan. Hard to lock him down. Yeah, he definitely is slippery. I saw someone describing it like a bird feeding their children. Oh, hold on. Double root. Okay. I wondered if Rekker was going to try to do anything else there. Go ahead. No, he's standing on a ward, and they seem to have all of the idea that he's standing there. Um, actually, wait, we have a gang, I think, in the top lane, but they ping out the ward. Never mind. So, Jax is going to be interesting to watch here, because he has nothing to do except for to take crowds. 
So he's gonna hang out in the mid lane for a moment. There's a control ward, so Firefly's unseen at the moment. Now's the time to step forward. Anime Lover trying to get a little bit of initial poke to set up for the Jax to come in. Shockwave from the Oriana. Boggers is trying to run away. It's not Boggers, it's Poopsters. Thank you for the window. You're getting that heal from Requiem, who just needs another auto attack to finish off Enrique. However, having to back away. Thank you for the win. Low health. But that's going to be the Galio backing one more time in the bottom lane. He's already down a level. You can see Enrique sitting at level 5 just because of how many times this Galio has had to back. Man, now, the Jax, I'm actually going to be interested to see his build. I'd really like to see the Spear of Sojin come out. Second, not a uh, Trinity Force. It'd make me happy. Not anyone does it, but it does make me happy. Celsius coming to that mid lane, getting a little bit of damage down onto Anime Lover, trying to get the reset. Nicely done. By reset, I mean those procs. I believe that's what, the Q? No, Q's the wolf. That's the E. E. Double check the Q those. is actually the dash, and the W is the wolf circle. And when the W is down, you have Q on a two-second cooldown. It shows you how much I know Kindred, because she's played so many times. When I met a champion, everyone loves Kindred. Play her more. Sorry. I play a lot of Kindred. <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, I should just... Do you stream? I should just watch your stream, then. No. She's incredible, but um, I'm not good enough to really stream, especially my Kindred gameplay. Uh, I don't jungle basically at all as a support main mm -hmm. and uh kindred one of those more complex champions especially with that ultimate but uh, Celsius... easy. go ahead no there's nothing that said it's easy <laughs> right if someone's gonna die you press r and then they don't die anymore true true that's the mechanic it, i don't understand if people it's get it's about up timing by. it's about timing it it's just it... about not wasting it and not using it too early i guess and like yes it's less about timing and more about not getting CC'd at the right time. Because everyone knows when you want to ult, right? It's not like the Ryze on the enemy team doesn't know that you want to ultimate when your teammate's about to die. So he's going to, like, maybe save his W to put you into a root. Or I guess that wouldn't work, so that's not the best example. But someone with an actual stun can stop champion. Leona! This is what Leona, I'm talking yeah. about. Leona is the best <laughs> champion in the game. Pretty easy there. Celsius, that Kindred, once again, hanging out in this mid lane. They've not burned the Flash, but they did get the heal earlier on Anime Lover. So, okay, we're gonna walk in. She's got red buff this time. Lots more slows and nice chains as well from Poopsers. The Shockwave gonna pull Celsius underneath the turret, but that just gets her in range for a couple more auto attacks. Gets low, Ooh. though. Enrique coming in. Galio's here as well. The culling comes out from Poopsers. Nicely done against Enrique. He clears up most of the minion, and that's just enough to push the bottom lane of GMU off this mid lane. So they're going to alleviate a lot of pressure out within the bot lane. And if we look at the CS lead right now, it's actually going to be 28 in the favor of UT. That is that is a bad look if you're trying to be a George Mason fan right now. That is a very bad look. Not as bad as last game, though. The mid lane is ahead. Last game, if you do recall, UT Austin was actually ahead in CS in every single lane and the jungle. Well, they're definitely ahead in this bottom lane. 20 CS up for... No, oh, that's 30 CS up for the Zaya. Yeah. And almost 10 CS up in the top lane. Woo! Relgun's going to get a little bit of poke onto the J4. The Flash, you engage here from the Jax in this bottom lane. They want Requiem down. They're going to burn the Ignite for it as well. Leap Strike from Firefly. A nice two-man route, but it's not going to be enough to take down the Jax, despite being close underneath the turret. And where was Rakan in that entire fight? He was off warding. <laughs> yeah, those are some of those uh, feel-bad moments. I feel like that the Zaya definitely had the potential to actually survive there. I have to assume a lot of things were on cooldown then, because the sequencing didn't feel uh, correct. Oh, in that top lane, Celsius looking for another gank. Had success in the mid lane, says I'll go ahead and visit Railgun on the top yeah. side. Take a turret shot as well, see if they could chase in. Drop the Chilling Smite onto the J4. Should be able to get out as he burned the Flash to make sure that he could survive the first Drake of the game. Once again, going over to this GMU. They did well with the Drake's last game. They lost, or they got everyone but the very end when Trundle was successful at stealing one away. This time, though, once again, they find a early dragon lead by getting and securing that Mountain Drake. Yeah, now the Mountain Drake early feels really good because that's actually going to help all of your laners to get turret plating. Um, wow, we can't overestimate that. Remember, two turret platings is actually going to be more gold than a single kill. Oh, beautiful in cage. There comes the Recon fighting a nice knockup into the shockwave from Silas as well. 100% CC, the Orianna. You can't go anywhere. Beautifully done. Yeah, that was a work of art. I'm going to be honest with you. 
So four kills to one. Once again, a lead for Austin. They're doing so well. They've got a 3,000 gold lead. But they had this last game and things fell apart for them. So as you're looking at these lanes and you're looking at their composition, are you seeing anything they can do to really secure themselves this lead once these turret plates fall off? Um, the first thing you want to do is secure this Rift Herald. I think it's actually in a really awkward position. There's not a lot of vision around it and that a team that was willing to dedicate a member or two over there would be able to get it. The issue is always going to be eventually that becomes some point of vision, right? Outside of the Rift Herald, everything has to be focused on the two side lanes that are down to two platings. Zach's gonna try to pinch this Kindred, but Celsius can just tumble over the wall, so she should be able to get out just fine. Uh, too much Dash difficulty. Dash is overpowered. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's why Jarvan's meta is because some champions don't have dashes. Well, bring back Gragas, baby. Get me those body slams. I do miss the Gragas body slams when they were free. And that top lane railgun looking for a little bit of fight against Ion. J4 trying to get in position for a couple of damage. He throws down the Cataclysm as well. He's looked so far like he's winning out on this fight, but then Hoopsers shows up. He steals away the Cataclysm so he himself can lock in. Nice flag oh. and drag from Ion. Dodges away a little bit of damage. He's trying to dodge the chase for forever, oh. but he cannot escape the Silas. And he will go down, leading to a fifth kill for Austin. He's styling on the Silas. There was a lot of uh, mechanics there. <sighs> yeah, that really took me by surprise. Although they're going to split the 320 gold between the two of them right now and finish off that turret, so it might even be a little bit more. So first turret, once again, going to go over to Austin. They did this well last game, but this time they've got a pretty good lead. And some of these laning fights have done a little bit better. I think that uh, Poopster's rotations have been much stronger this game, actually able to find leads rather than just kind of show up and say hi and leave. Bottom lane's going to shove in once again onto this bottom lane turret. It's down to two plates. We got ourselves 45 seconds before these plates fall off, so it looks like with Kindred here, they really want to go for the complete tower secure. They're going to lose the wave, though, and back up for now. Man. So now with the top turret dead, the question's actually going to come down as to when do we swap our bot lane and where do we swap them? The where is really easy answer. That's the mid lane. Um, oh, the engage by the Galio. Can't find the taunt, though. His Reckon's going to go ahead and drop the ult. However, with the Zaya low on mana, they're going to go ahead and back away after that. Go ahead. No, they really need to do this. Their bot lane needs to get mid as soon as possible, even if they're just, like, doing it so that way that they can get proper lane assignments and get the Silas onto a side lane. So either two teleports are split right now, right? That'd be absolutely everything you want. The issue is, I, mm, now nah, Silas will be fine bot lane even though his teleport's down. And Although I guess we won't get that. Firefly spending a lot of time in this mid lane as Kindred is there as well, trying to make sure that mid lane turret is at least secure and won't fall. As the bottom lane turret dropping incredibly low. Rada's trying to make them pay for really wanting it. He's got the top. A nice knock up and quickness from the Rakan. The turret still falls. Guy ultimately comes through, but the Zaya is gone. Thank you for the win. Forced to flash away. Enrique decides not to follow, but they get themselves one despite losing the turret. Enrique dealt big damage there, um, and that almost felt like that he shouldn't have, right? Galio, I think the ultimate might have been a misplay in that situation, but you normally don't know until you've done it. Oh, I think J4 might have been trying to flag his way out of the fight against Railgun, but he's going to go right back and drops the Cataclysm, Ooh. immediately locks it away as Railgun forces is forced to use the Flash to get out. Jax is kind of coming up from behind as well. Yeah, that's what I mean by the Cataclysm by some champions at least only escapable by that Flash, um, which is why it's such a valued ultimate ability. Now they're going to be setting their eyes onto this Mountain Drake, and this would be number two for the side of uh, George Mason, but instead it looks like it's going to be going over to UT Austin. Yeah, so Austin starts it up. No one really there to contend that, but the in, uh, El yeah, the Elder Drake coming up at the 15-minute mark. What a take! Uh, no, Rift Herald is going to be started by the side of GMU. They're not going to go for it anymore. Instead, they want the fight. They're going to find the stun onto Requiem. Thank you for the win. It's going to get a bit of damage onto two members, but Galio, frontline tank, is here to get himself a kill as well. Ion gets a flag and drag to safety. The Shelly going to be dropped low. Finally, it drops. Lucia wants to pick it up. It's actually Jack is able to secure it, and now they all have to get away. Rylas says, I'll be the sacrificial lamb. I'll walk in, tank everybody up, and go down to make sure you all <laughs> escape. So he does lose his life, but the rest of the four members of GMU are going to live for now until Celsius oh, flashes forward right in. Off. They're going to see the Galio ultimate comes in. Not going to do that much from Poopsers. 
Celsius. I'm a huge, I'm a fan now. That's how you win me. You do a flash, engage, and steal the red buff away. I'm a fan. I mean, when you gotta get every edge that matter, every edge that you can, stealing away something like that is important. He lost the Rift Herald, so that is in the hands of the Galio. was actually the one who secured it. He was just behind the jacks. We'll see where he decides to drop it, as there are still three turrets up. Also, uh, GMU unsuccessful at taking any turrets so far this game. Oh, the quickness Ooh. used by Rakan. They find the taunt onto Enrique. I think he's going to be in trouble and he's going to go down. Silas able to secure it. He's been taunted up underneath the turret, but Poops doesn't care. He's just going to walk away. Yeah, he was not prepared for that actual engage coming out of the Rakan. And I think that's why we actually saw some of the nerfs onto him because his ultimate is so reliable. Um, but nonetheless, a good usage there by Thank You for Win. 7 kills to 3, but a 5,000 gold lead for the side of Austin. They're feeling really good. Last game, they're only get, able to get about 3,000 gold lead. They're doing a lot better this game, finding those rotations and picks. However, they're going to be engaged upon. This is a team fight, and this is what GMU successful at. Cataclysm under two members. Iona in trouble. He's going to be dropped low flashes away. The taunt's going to come through onto the Kindred, but she is still full health and backs away. And when you are this much gold ahead, you can take some of those team fights. They've burned one ultimate now on the enemy team side. Oriana is here. We'll see what she can do. Shockwave is kind of wasted. Actually, Poops was used it. There it is! A four-man shockwave! The rest of the team going to try to collapse as well. Fireflies in the middle of everyone. Leaping strike. Make sure he secures one onto the Kindred. Poops is going to be trying to do what he can. Chains knockups as Railgun going to come in. Try to clean up the fight. Firefly in trouble. A nice two-man taunt. By thank you for the win. But Anime Lover will secure one more. Now Railgun can drop the auto attack take a triple kill and what looked so good for gmu gets turned around as railgun shows up and shuts them down yeah railgun really showing us the power of the jace there and i mean he may not be the strongest pick in the lane which i he can be into certain picks definitely into jarvan he is right and when you want to go the flag but out of the lane he's able to clean up like a madman and just comes off the back of a split push too All wow right. props to railgun Securing that second turret in the mid as well gives them a 4-0 to zero turret lead, a 7,000 gold lead. And this is obviously what they were looking for last game. They couldn't quite pull the trigger on. Now that they're so far ahead, it's going to be on GMU to pick and choose these team fights carefully because they can no longer just rely on let's just throw everything in the middle of the team fight we have enough damage that we're going to be able to win now they have to pick them carefully and say okay we know that somebody's in the top side or you know we need a pick before we can do this team fight as Celsius going to come into the mid lane Shell's going to get a, a jump onto the turret Rylas going to nice two man ton as well as a knock up the clone comes through the Kindred ultimate started Galio ulting himself to safety as well so they burn one ult on the Kindred but can't find the kill yeah, so taunt one of those things that will actually stop the Kindred ultimate, and we almost saw right there is that it could have cost Celsius his life. Does survive, however, and now teams are going to go reset, look to clear some vision. We do see little spots of red on the map. Actually, I would really like to see the side of uh, Texas just doing a little bit better. Yeah, Austin, they've got a couple of wards on the early edge, but not nearly as deep as it was last game. This time, though, look at the control wards through the river. One on the Baron, two towards the Dragon. They said, you know what, maybe we got a little overzealous last game. Let's play a touch more defensively and just keep Vision on the river as Anime Lovers got to dance in shoes around. Playing that dancing robot. Celsius going to come in and say, you can't dance away from my auto attack. Shockwave just a bit too late. And Kindred finds herself another nice kill. I want to check in very quickly on Kindred's stacks. The camera keeps moving. Gimme Kindred. Just want to see what are her stacks at. Six stacks at the moment. So she feeling pretty good at this point in the game. Jack's going to hold on be jumped on for a moment. Okay, never mind. Rakan just doing Rakan things. Yeah, so when you talk about Rakan things... I feel like that there's one thing that he hasn't done this game that Rakans do pretty much every game, at least where I see them in, and that's feed. Um, and it's not in any type of feeding that like we see with anyone else. It's where they dive in and then they expect their team to still be there to dash out to and they're not, so they'll engage in feed, they'll get caught out going on warding missions because all they have is that one dash to get away and they actually end up not making much ground because it takes so long to activate. Like, the story of Rakans is not too good in my eyes, and this has been one phenomenal one. 
Oh yeah, 116, picking and choosing his engages. And I gotta give credit to him underneath the turret as well. Obviously, thank you for the win. Very comfortable on this champion. Dashing under the turret multiple times to get knockups, burn flashes, and then dash to the Zaya to get out as well. Good synergy between those bottom laners. And they also did well last game as well. So it's one of those maybe to keep our eye on as the series continues for UT Austin is the fact their bottom lane can really hold their own. They're strong enough that they can either win the lane or at least go even. And last game, they absolutely destroyed. This game, a touch more even, but still did very well. Well, the gold dude's further than I think it was in any standing still point last game. Um, last game, I think we actually saw bigger than a 5k gold lead until the end, right? Uh, I'm not positive about that. It might have been only up to about three, three or 4,000 gold before it got so like, man, I'm not even going to give you five. Definitely this this game, 8,000 gold, the farthest uh, lead that Austin has had by far. How many times can I say far? It's a far-sighted question. I mean, you'd have to ask Farquad if you wanted to get an answer to that one. Oh, man. <laughs> I'll forward him a letter and uh, see if he'll respond. Just make sure that you put that to far, far away land. <laughs> All right, well, let's look far over here in the game as I'm trying to wrap up all those puns and uh, well actually we could continue as both teams are just waiting neither team wants to pull the trigger for the side of Austin they're in the lead but they really want to secure at least one kill definitely the jungler on the enemy side before going for the Baron even though they have that lead and for GMU as we said they have to pick these fights a little bit more carefully not comfortable yet to go in. They're just going to sit around, wait, and go back to clearing. Now, if we do see an engage, I imagine it's going to come off the back of the Jarvan. The issue is, if we look, every single summoner spell is up across the board, except for Lucian's heal. It's going to be up in about 5, 4, 3, 2, and every summoner spell's up. Could mean we get an explosive fight as Poops is going to be the target. He's stolen away the calling himself. Goes golden for the moment. The target will be time. Missed time as Poops is flashing away. Now he has to run. In the meantime, the Lucius is pumped because he's on the wrong side of the fight. I am going to go in. Drop the Cataclysm. He's going to be able to take down one. However, Celsius is in that back line. Finding Anime Lover. Drops him low. Forces the flash out of the Orianna. Celsius is still alive until she gets jumped on. Orianna's got massive damage. It's a 3v3 at the moment. 3v4, excuse me, until Chase makes it a 3v3. Helping the casters out. Rail with nice burst damage from a massive mile away. Five, zero, and three. With that three for three, or two for two, I guess. Uh, GMU is backing away. Thank you for the win. Wanting to re-engage. He's stunned up. He's not underneath the turret, though. Able to hop away for now. What a slippery champion. That's Railgun. Trying to re-engage. Zaya wants this turret, though, and she's going to get it. Oof. Demolish on Rakan feels good. Turret. We're actually walking through vision. Turret dropped. GMU in trouble. They are down 9,000 gold. They are no longer winning these team fights. They are going to have to rely on their scaling, which, to be fair, isn't the best. You look at Lucian. He's an early game duelist. Sure, he does nice damage late game, but it's not nearly as much as Zaya is, especially when it comes to AoE team fighting, which at this point, Austin's got plenty of gold to be almost a full item up. You look at their entire lineup, two and a half items for most of them, as the side of GMU are sitting on one, one and a half, two, one. It's definitely a rough story for them. Man. I really want to see them try to make a position around this bear. And the issue is that if you look at the vision right now, it's so heavily on the side of UT Austin that I actually don't see a way that George Mason finds their foothold except for this one little bush they've cut out for them. I am going to be in trouble. Rakan going to go ahead and use the quickness. It's very early, but they're taking out the J4. Two members stunned up for the moment. There's the Shockwave on the two as well. Requiem drops the ultimate, and now the Kindred ultimate. Trying to keep everyone alive. We want more team fighting is what she says. And the Silas uses the Orianna's ult himself, and that will be securing a nice victory for GMU as they clean up four members. The Enrique, the only one left alive. What is he going to do to try to defend? I don't think he can do anything. Railgun pushes down the mid lane turret. The Rakan trying to chase out Lucian. The Baron's been started up. Hoops or Celsius and Requiem burning it down quickly. Lucian around the corner, but he's not going to be able to stop this in time. And the, tur the and Baron goes over to GMU. Uh, I'm sorry, Austin. I've got my name swapped on my screen. 
Wow, I just... Total mayhem pandemonium breaks out. And at the end of the day, it looks like UT Austin walks away with everything. A lot of that was off of, as you talked about early on into the game, the Kindred Ultimate basically reset the fight. And when you are so ahead in items and damage, you can take a fight like that. You can reset it with the Kindred. And then afterwards, you're still going to have more damage and you're going to win. On top of that, Poopster is doing a fantastic job stealing away the Oriana Ultimate and then jumping into the middle of the fight and shockwaving multiple members Basically just CCing them and dealing tons of damage as he is heavily AP based. So good play now gives them a 12,000 gold lead. Ah, GMU, you are definitely out of options at this point. You can no longer take a 5v5. You can no longer split push. You can no longer do anything besides turtle and hope that Austin makes a major mistake. Major mistake is definitely what it's going to take here. Um, some minor mistakes that could happen that might also cause this, I think, are trying to dive under either of the inhibitor turrets. Uh, a major mistake could be diving under the nexus turrets. The other one I can see is trying to fight while taking Oh, the here's rate. a fight attempted in that bottom lane. The TP coming through from the Silas, though, immediately says to GMU, let's call off. Railgun's also taking our mid lane inhibitor turret. Inhibitor itself is the turret's already gone. So back to turtling they go. See, I'm fearful that these players are going... No. Bottom lane, oh, inhibitor turret, down to about half. There's the Cataclysm from the Silas. I am going to try to do his own version. Double Catalyst on top of each other, but look at the damage. That's the ace for UT Austin. They've been waiting for that the entire game long. Triple kill for the Kindred as well. They don't even need the ultimate. They walk through the enemy champions. Your minions to us will take your Nexus as well. And they've tied the games up 1-1. Wait, did they tie it up? I thought they won last game. No, oh, they did GMU. It is tied up. You're right. Yep. My bad. So if we want to look through kind of what changed and what's happened during this draft, the first thing I want to say is that the Galio is not the problem. Um, I think the Galio is totally fine. I think that the biggest problem that they ran into this game is Kindred got a really early and lucky start and they let a team that outscales them beat them consistently at every step of the game. Um, it's not really the draft, it's the execution of the draft. The only drafting issue that I see is probably the Jax because Jax doesn't end up bringing you as much utility as you need in this team. And they definitely bled and bled hard at the beginning of the game. You saw for a while it was, I believe, like two and oh and then five and one they were losing members left right and center and something has to be done about this bottom lane from ut austin thank you for the win and requiem are an absolute god pairing every time they are just so heavily pushed up in the enemy team's face causing them to lose cs lose the lane lose everything it's almost been five plates to requiem every game let's see if ut austin can pull that in for game number three as well as we take a quick break and we'll be right back don't go anywhere Woo.